Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to Projections, our weekly show about virtual reality and augmented reality. And this week we're talking about what Windows, Microsoft is calling Windows Mixed Reality. Immersive headsets. <laughs> so th they've had Windows Mixed Reality since HoloLens was announced. Yes, and I guess that's the only reason you could actually call it Mixed Reality is because they have AR that's and right. VR products. But the WMR products, to be clear, their VR headsets. Yeah, these are. The new ones that were released just last month uh, in Microsoft stores across the country. And along with the Windows 10 Fall Creators Update, which adds built-in support mm -hmm. for their interface, uh, we've been using two of their headsets. We have one from Acer and one from Lenovo. Mm -hmm. And there are also headsets made from companies like Dell, Asus, Samsung has one that's slightly different. Yeah. Um, it's worth saying that all of the headsets are based off the same reference design that Microsoft provided to the manufacturers. And the manufacturers basically did their own industrial design around this reference. They're all almost exactly the same experience. Yeah, so while you may read online that there are slight differences in terms of the field of view, for example, they're basically the yeah. same. Putting up the Acer headset close to your face or the Lenovo headset close to your face, the experience is identical. They both, these headsets at least, require right. plug-in headphones. They have the same type of uh, head strap that you strap it into, that, that you mount to your head, um, and they have the exact same controllers. The only outlier is the Samsung headset, which costs $50 more. It's a $500 headset, and it does have integrated audio and an integrated microphone and a slightly higher resolution screen, also an OLED screen, whereas these are all LCD. Right, so uh, one question you might have is how do these headsets, if this is all based on the same reference design, compare to some Something like the Oculus Rift yes. or the HTC Vive. Now that we have, now including PSVR, four major platforms in VR. Where should we start? Well, let's start talking about um, the the technical aspects, right? I think what, that's what a lot of people care about. Resolution. Mm -hmm. Sure. These are 1440 by 1440 headsets on each eye. Per eye. So how does that compare to the Oculus Rift or the, the Vive? Yeah, so the Rift and the Vive have the same resolutions, which are per eye mm -hmm. 1080 wide by 1200 tall. And so you actually get a significant more number of more pixels mm -hmm. on the Windows Mixed Reality headsets. Right, and I did notice that. So we, we did a nice A-B comparison where we jumped into Space Pirate Trainer in both headsets and just standing at the main screen where you're choosing your game and you see your loadout and all that, um, you can tell a big difference in pixel density. Uh, whether you're looking at solid colors or text or anything in the screen, it just seems a little bit more solid. Whereas with the Rift, we I feel like years from now, when we put the Rift back on, these first generation headsets, we're going to notice pixel, you know, the lack of pixel density is going to be a big uh, compromise. And it's good that we talk about this in terms of uh, experiential pixel density and mm -hmm. not just absolute numbers because the resolution is related to the field of view and related to how, how big the panels are and also what type of displays they are. For example, the, the Rift, the Vive, they use OLED panels, and, and those panels have a sub-pixel arrangement that aren't, they don't fill as much as RGB stripe, for example. So if you look at um, a, a image, like a, like a single color, you know, a red image, a block of red text with your Oculus Rift, you may notice more screen door effect than you may notice with, you know, if you look at that same image mm -hmm. with an LCD with RGB stripe. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't say the screen door effect is necessarily gone with any headset we've ever seen. Definitely not. Um, and we're hopefully one day, but um, it's definitely a little more solid with these headsets. That's one of the pros, I would say. And that screen door effect is also mitigated uh, by the type of optics you use. Mm -hmm. And the Rift uses a hybrid for now lens, and so we've called described it as maybe like a, a linen effect. You see almost like very thin uh, vertical lines, parallel lines that mask that screen door. Mm -hmm. um, with these headsets, I think they're, they're um, some type of a hybrid Fresnel lens as well. Um, it does. You can. I, I can. I can make out that screen door effect a little bit more if I squint, even though there are more pixels and the pixel fill is pretty good. Yeah, it's it's headsets. a different looking screen door effect. Like it's a, it's a you know it's a triangular one. Right, right. As opposed to the more linear one that the Rift appears with with those optics. Now something um, else with these lenses though is the sweet spot. Yeah, you know what, as I was comparing them, certainly the sweet spot on any headset is not as wide as we want. The sweet spot we're referring to is like the area that is within focus. So mm -hmm. as you're looking straight ahead, how much 
do you actually see that is completely you know resolves and in focus and not blurry as you start to get to the edge of these lenses you start to see what you know we refer to as like god rays or blurriness and it affects two things it affects how much your eye can move around, how much your eye can wander right. and comfortably in a headset, and also how much fidgeting you might want to do with a headset to get your eyes in the center to begin with. Yeah, like if we're looking around the world, even with our own eyes, like only a little bit is actually in focus, but we can dart our eyes in any direction and resolve anything that within focus. With the right. lenses, you have to look straight ahead yes. in order to get that, that focus. And I would say it's small. It is a small area of focus on the Windows Mixed Reality. It's also small on the Rift, but I feel like the Rift and the Vive degrade a little more subtly as, mm -hmm. you, as you leave that area of, uh, you know, of focus. It becomes very clear when you have one of these headsets on that if you just keep your head straight and look even, I would say, 30 degrees off to any side, the image is going to get a little fuzzy, a little warped even. Yeah. Um, and it was very noticeable in the, the cliff house in the, the primary interface mm -hmm. for Windows Mixed Reality. I feel like we've almost buried one of the big leads about the headset, which is that it has inside-out tracking. Yeah. I feel like that's huge. I really do. I feel like this is a big leap forward for VR in general. Uh, from a setup standpoint, it's the easiest VR headset that I've set up that has any kind of three degree of freedom tracking. Um, it is literally two cables. It is an HDMI and it's a USB 3, and it gets its power over that. And then um, all of the tracking is done through these two, you know, like what I assume is a, a stereo cameras or an yeah. IR emitter and a camera. And uh, it's, it's actually quite good. I mean, you can, once it's all set up and it, it doesn't take much to set it up, you basically look around for a moment and then you set up your boundary. Same, just like the other guys, they have a guardian type system where you walk your headset, not a controller, right, the right. headset around the room and that establishes your borders, and then you're good to go. And it actually will remember the space. So if you put the headset back on, uh, there's no worrying about, have I moved my sensors? There's yeah. no, you know, nobody's going to trip over them and mess up your, your tracking. And it's true, six degrees of freedom, yeah. lateral movement. Uh, but, but something we couldn't do that we thought we could do was um, actually walk around completely uh, with this. Oh, like if you had a backpack computer exactly. or something. Because it does recognize a limited space mm. as your play area, which is a fairly big space, like we tried this this whole office, uh, we couldn't, once once we set up that guardian system, that boundary system, and move the headset out of there, then it thinks it's out of your play space. And what happens then? Uh, well, well, a lot of times it does work, um, but when you if you start it on, it will just ask you to reset up the space mm -hmm. again. Yeah. I did like their guardian system. I, uh, compared to the other guys, I think I might actually prefer it. It's mm. It's not this huge grid that's there. And with the other guys, you can say how blatant do you want that grid to be. But with this one, it's just a, it's a big you know, quad. And then as you get toward, uh, closer to it with the controller of your headset, these concentric rings start to appear. And the closer you get, the more rings there are. So it's, it's, it's a good effect. It's a good trade-off between immersion and safety, I think. Yeah. Um, and then there's, of course, not only is the headset in the world track with these, these, uh, this inside-out tracking system, but also the controllers. Yeah. And we have the controllers here. You actually see the lights. They turn on. They're, they're on the whole time. They're yeah. not invisible or masked or anything. Um, and which they actually make it pretty bright. They have a visible flicker, too. I feel like I can see them you know, flickering more than, than I expect to with, mm. with, with lights. Uh, there is somewhat controller parity, button parity, between this and your Oculus Touch controller. They don't have capacitive sensors or anything, but yeah. you do have a you have a trigger. It's an analog trigger. You have a grip button. Mm -hmm. You have both a thumbstick and a touchpad. Kind of covered all the bases. Yep, and then you have a menu button and also this Windows button that jumps you back into that Cliff House uh, launcher that they have. Uh, but the ergonomics of the controller, I think they feel a little bit chintzy. They feel a little bit like like this is a like a more of a plastic toy is, is, as uh, as much as a um, a well designed um, controller device. I agree with you. It's not the controller I would expect from the guys who made the 360 controller, right? Which is like you know probably still my favorite gamepad controller, uh, which is just robust, perfect feel, good weight. Um, this is a reference design they that they brand for everybody. Yep. But everyone gets appears to get the same controllers. Although I do think the Samsungs have a slightly slicker feel to them, the, mm -hmm. the industrial design, the injection molding. But I agree with you. It, it's uh, it it doesn't have a whole lot of weight. The haptics aren't that strong, um, and the touchpad is very small. Yeah, yeah. Touchpad is very small, especially when we're talking about using that as an analog for something like the Steam controller yeah. and the Vive controller touchpads. This is a poor imitation, I think, of that. Uh, but the tracking of the controller, you know, it works. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. It works if, if, you, if your controllers are in front of you. Now, yeah. this is the downside of inside-out tracking, is that this headset has to be able to see your controllers. And it, it does see beyond your peripheral view. So Your, your visual your field of view. So yes. I can't see the tracking get lost. But as it moves past that, my peripheral view, that's where it actually does get lost. Yeah. And that, that does become a factor. Like I, I was playing Space Pirate Trainer and I was blocking with one you know, shield over here and shooting with this hand. And while I'm not sure that I got damaged or was shot more than I otherwise would, it's just distracting to see things snap back into place as I bring my hands back into view. Because you're holding something that's supposed to be big. It breaks the illusion. And that breaks the illusion. You see shadows, of jumping shadows for your controller. Yeah. Not only does it uh, not work for things that are outside your field of view, but things that are too close to your field of view, that also breaks the tracking as well. If you get the controller too close to your face, uh, which I sometimes do when I'm like moving the, moving the headset yeah. um, or adjusting it. Right. And so it, it's definitely not perfect. It's suitable for a large number of VR applications as, mm -hmm. we, as we've tried, um, but it's, it's a step down. The main thing you're gonna, if you have one of these headsets, you're going to um, see as soon as you start to use it is the cliff house. Now that's, that's the environment, that's the Windows environment that Microsoft has, has built um, that provides basically your user interface to everything else that you would otherwise do in Windows. And what, what struck me was that it's really, it feels so Microsoft because every interface is just literally a two-dimensional panel that is basically a Windows interface. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, there's nothing warped around you that they didn't, use 3D or virtual reality. You can bring in objects, they call them holograms, which are models essentially, and place them around your space. And that's in a library within one of their applications. Yeah. But they they run static loops and... and the storefront, it's like the edges everywhere. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's definitely a very Microsoft solution to VR. And it doesn't feel very, even though you can customize a little bit, like there's not a lot to do in there. It doesn't feel very interactive. No, very little. Like you can, yes, bring up a web page and you can web browse if you want to. You can use your real keyboard or you can type with a virtual keyboard, but I tried that and just to try it, it kind of works. You can't, right. you can't even scroll well. You actually have to, you know, for some, some windows, you actually have to point, laser point at the scroll bar to mm -hmm. scroll. I, I found I could grab the page as long as I didn't click something that was clickable and right. then swipe it off. Also, the touchpad seemed to work sometimes. sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but the biggest thing for these is, I believe, is uh, basically for me, is the Steam support. Which launched this week, and that's why we're covering this week. Before, previously, just in the Windows Store, there were maybe a dozen VR things you can actually do. Yeah. A few games that were ported over, Arizona Sunshine, Space Pirate Trainer. But this week, the floodgates were open because Valve has built in Windows Mixed Reality headset support. So you download in your Steam, in your Steam application, you download a separate Windows Mixed Reality program, a launcher, Run that. Yeah, you don't even see it. It's some kind of a driver thing. And it, then your Steam VR, all your applications just basically work, and they've mapped this controller to this controller. Right. So every game, uh, you will now see Vive controllers in your hand if, if it supports that kind of view. Or you can see uh, they have models for the Windows Mixed Reality controller in the Steam Home interface. Right. Steam yes. VR Home interface. Um, and you know, like I said, there's button parity. So you have a trigger. You have the grip button. Uh, the touchpad is the only analog to the actual touchpad. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a Oculus Touch controller, this one doesn't have a touchpad, so you use the the thumbstick. And I actually like the thumbstick as a replacement, as an optional replacement for uh, the Valve trackpad yeah. for some cases, there is no, you can't use this thumbstick. This thumbstick is not accessible, at least right now, in Steam VR. And I wish you could actually use both or for some games. It, makes, it would you make a lot of sense. You do use the thumbstick for one thing, and that's to get back to Steam. So yes. To bring up your Steam interface. Yep. Normally on a Vive wand, you would use the Steam button, but this is the Microsoft button. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> so you use the right hand and you click in the uh, left analog stick. That brings up your Steam interface. Now, what's interesting, if, if you do hit the Windows button, it brings you immediately back to Cliff House, which tells me it's running yep. all the time in the background. And, not, and that's nice from a user experience standpoint. It warp right back in there. Um, but it's an odd experience to get back into Steam. So the way that you launch Steam, unfortunately right now, and it's still in beta, I'm sure they'll improve, improve this, but there is a, uh, basically a, a window into your Windows desktop, and you use it just as you would a mouse and keyboard. You launch the Steam VR, you warp into Steam VR. If you go back to the Cliff House, there's a big blue box 
It's a it's like a, a window rectangle. Again, very Microsoft. It's a micro, it's a Windows box that's a window on the desktop, and you just click that, and that's how you get back into it. Not terribly intuitive. It seems completely just bootstrapped yeah. and, and band-aided on and not a well-integrated solution. Mm -hmm. And it's in those Steam VR experiences and games that we did notice some of the limitations of this headset and this inside-out tracking. Uh, things you mentioned, like in Space Pirate Trainer, yeah, that's in both stores, mm -hmm. and you saw that limitations. But like games like Onward or Killing Floor Incursion, games where you actually have to hold things in your chest, it didn't work well at all. I was trying to hold like a, a machine gun rifle, you right? To, you would have to look down. I'd have I to imagine. look down, grab it, and I hold it like this, mm -hmm. and even when I hold it like this, the head, it loses tracking, yeah. and it starts floating away. <laughs> well, that's the downside of, of the inside-out tracking. There are, there are the conveniences and there's the compromises. Yeah. I mean, th the nice thing is it does seem to run everything. It's not like games have to be recompiled. There are some things where I ran into an issue where it looked like sensor, it said sensor not detected. Like oh, really? Like from the beginning? Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Even though it was, tracking was working well, mm -hmm. it just needed that extra layer to say, it's okay that you don't have Oculus cameras plugged in mm -hmm. or Vive or Vive cameras or Vive projectors plugged in. Interesting. I wonder if that's a matter for the developers looking for something that's too specific. Yeah. Um, I played 11 VR tennis mm -hmm. and um, this con the controller actually maps well to a, to a ping pong paddle. I was mm. impressed by how well that felt. Um, it played okay. The problem was I felt like I was getting some frame rate loss, which is something I don't experience with the Rift or the Vive in that game. And it, I started to wonder, is that because the Cliff House is also running in the background. I and mean, that's a 3D environment with sound right. and a whole lot going on. And it's also a high resolution display that you're rendering it. It's pushing a it few It is more a higher resolution out. display. It's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but all in all, I mean, the experiences are, are good. Like, you could, I wouldn't, I would still, if, if I had all three headsets out here, I'm still going to pick, you know, the Vive or the Rift mm -hmm. to play most of those games. But you get, I'd say, 90% of the experiences with the Windows Mixed Reality headsets and a little bit better. A um, little bit better pixel density, and the ease of setup, I think, is undeniable. Two ports to plug in. I mean, I was surprised when I opened the box. I thought I was missing things, but exactly. it was just the controllers, the headset, super simple to plug in. If you unplug it and plug it back in, it just works. The drivers are, are perfect. And comfort-wise, I actually like the comfort of this design. It reminds me of that PSVR design. And um, I, I thought it was very comfortable, very lightweight. Well, it's worth pointing out there is no integrated audio. And that, that's a huge selling point for the Rift for me, or the Vive with the Pro Audio Strap. Yeah. Um, I think that's huge. And the Samsung, if you're talking about Windows Mixed Reality. Um, so I, I would need that. Like at this point, the convenience of taking one thing on and off is essential to me. If I were considering Windows Mixed Reality, I would look at the Samsung device. Um, but that's $100 more than the Rift. And the controllers on the Rift are my favorite controllers yeah. um, of all the VR headsets. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. The, as you said, the ease of setup as well as the ease of tearing down. So, like, if you're yeah. a portable VR person, this is hard to beat. It really is. Yeah, and also one thing this has that the other headsets don't have, the ability to, to flip up the, mm -hmm. the HMD. So you can actually go back to your keyboard, use your keyboard and mouse, and then flip this back in. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's convenient. Not all of them have that. Um, that, that is one of the nice things about the... Uh, the Lenovo and the, the Acer. You know, we're already, I think, a couple weeks into the launch of these headsets and coming up, you know, there are some sales for Black Friday and Microsoft is going to be discounting in the U.S., I think, $100 off these headsets. Mm -hmm. That makes it a pretty compelling price point when you're talking about that $300, $350 range for something that's complete. Um, but if you can afford it, I would still go pay, pay $400 for the, for the Rift. Yeah, I would too. Um, however, if it's the VR headset you're given for Christmas or if it's the one you can afford. Throw it back in their face. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, honestly, I feel like this is, a, this, is, this is okay. Like this is a decent outing into VR. And if it's, if it's what gets you into VR, great. The resolution is, is better than the other two major players. And the inside out tracking is, while it has limitations, it's also very easy to set up. Um, they so. really needed that Steam VR integration. I think without that Steam VR integration that they, they launched this week, this would be dead on arrival. Absolutely, and I'm glad they did it. I mean, Microsoft, who knows? Like, you have to buy everything through the Microsoft Store. They yeah. could have said that. I mean, what it really feels like is that this is not a full-hearted attempt into VR. Mm. The same way that Valve, HTC, and Oculus have not only developed specialized hardware, but also invested in content. It doesn't feel, it feels like Microsoft wants to put their foot in the door in VR and, 
and maybe build towards something in the future, but it doesn't feel like this is all in. in the VR fact that they call it mixed reality tells me there's more coming. I mean, the HoloLens is a very expensive developer, basically a developer you know, kit now. That's gonna trickle down and we're going to see things that really are mixed reality coming from all the players, including Microsoft. And I'm glad everyone's invested in this because this is a very, very interesting forward-looking space. All right, well, that's our look into the Windows Mixed Reality headsets. As they stand today, the one that we haven't used is the Samsung Odyssey HMD, which has high resolution, a little better um, OLED screen, mm -hmm. uh, maybe more comfortable controllers, but we're looking for that in the future. If you have questions about the Windows Mixed Reality headset experience, please place them in the comments below, and we'll try to answer them as best as possible. But otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.